Well, good morning and thank you very much for being here to honor our colleague who are presenter and then later on the students sponsored by faculty who are going to make a, a huge presentation that has become a hallmark of Lawrence Tech. Six years ago when I arrived here, Provost and I spoke about, about research. What is the status of research, tenure, promotion and all that? Of course, she's herself a good researcher of her time before she entered administration. And she was very supportive, but I did not see a form organized platform for research. And to say we are a teaching institution, not a research, was not digestible for me. How can we say we are a teaching institution? Then we should be a college, not a university. University, by very nature, is interested in new knowledge produced by research scholarship and endeavors. And then you bring that into classroom, in the boardroom, in the, in the platform of wherever you go, whether it's your laboratory or any other avenue. And we already had all that. We haven't packaged that. So now six years later, you see you are in awe of how fast we have moved because all the elements were already here. We just wanted to frame them and put them on a nice platform. Last year, uh, we had a great show of researchers in the poster session, this year even bigger. I can f very confidently say that pound for pound, as they say in boxing, we are better than any institution of our size that does so much research. So we need to applaud everyone. Thank you. All colleges do research. Uh, all have distinction. They are known for what they do, and the alumni from those colleges are reflective of the greatness of this institution. But we added a very different element last year. Uh, I was attending someone on campus, so I just walked in almost on time. I think there was some conversation before I came, so I might be repeating what was already said. But with Howard Hughes, the issue isn't that it's a very big grant, which it is that we are the only uh, school or college, university in the state to have received that out of 500 who applied uh, in the state. But the important thing is that Shopping Mall Provost and Lior and his colleague CJ Chung also involved, they created a vision which is awesome. For example, forgive me for taking more time, but it's important that you understand it's important beyond the award, beyond the recognition that this is a college now, arts and sciences, where every student is going to be doing a research project. That cannot happen even at larger institution. University of Michigan cannot do it. MSU cannot do it, regardless how much money they have. Because the creativity of the leaders in the college, they put the research component in the curriculum. That is the beauty. In that, rather than having a separate laboratory, or separate area to research projects where you need a lot of equipment, a lot of laboratory space and money and research assistance. If it becomes part of your curriculum, then you cannot graduate without doing research. I think that may be the first school in the state. I cannot say over the United States. And we need to applaud that as well. Yeah. And that was the seminal thing as I understand having had Harvard Hughes in my times, which was very attractive to Harvard Hughes Medical Institute, that the entire college will be participating in undergraduate research. That's the foundation of scholarship beyond that. So today we have risen to another level where our scholar faculty are marvelous. They recognize, they do books, chapters, conferences. Their work is being referenced by other institutions. And one such person is today's speaker. Patty Castelli. Dr. Castelli has brought a lot of attention through her work and her scholarship, and also that it continues to evolve. It is not that she has reached a plateau. It's continued to evolve, for which I'm very happy and proud. So today you have another uh, platform for another one of our faculty who had excelled. And it is selected by a group of reviewers. It's not that we pick somebody we like, but it is almost a little bit comparative. Not that we don't like you, Patty. <laughs> 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 
but it is very uh, carefully selected. So we keep presenting the very best faculty work in front of you, but everybody will get a chance with time. I hope you're young enough to stay here a long time. <laughs> with that, I will take leave of you, and ha hopefully you'll enjoy this uh, lecture. And also, please do stay for the poster session, because the best we can do for the students is show them our appreciation and involvement. If they spend months and years of doing the work with their sponsored faculty, and we don't even show up to see it, it discourages them. It, it lowers the impact of their work. So I call on you that you please support them, be there, speak with them. Thank you, enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Margill. Uh, I want to also uh, join Dr. Margill in thanking everybody for coming today. Uh, of course, we, we highlighted today the, you know, our grant with HHMI, but frankly, I want, to, I want you all to know, uh, you know, but you know, people that are from the outside, that actually today we can say that at Lawrence Tech all our students have uh, some kind of a research experience. It does not come as scientific research kind of, do you know, the same way in the College of Arts and Sciences as it is in the College of Management, as it is in the College of Architecture and Design, or in the College of Engineering. There, there are more applied projects, but frankly, I am so happy to be able to tell Dr. Modgill that was his dream when I came to Lawrence Tech, that today we are in an environment where every single student that starts at Lawrence Tech, when they end and they add a meaningful applied project or, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a research experience. So thank you very much for all the faculty that are here because you are the people that actually do it. You are the facilitators, you are the people that are, you know, down in the trenches and that give the experience that our students have today. Now, I'm going to have to read the introduction to Dr. Perry Castelli, although I know her for a long time. I'm going to say a couple of things that are not in the little bio that you have in the presentation. And, but I am, um, especially, I was so, um, so impressed with the list of companies that she had to work, that she worked with, that I want to make sure that we mention them. So, Dr. Patricia Castelli has been a full-time faculty member at Lawrence Tech since 1995. She received a, P a PhD in Instructional Design from Wayne State, a Master's of Business Administration from Lawrence Tech, and the Bachelor of General Studies from Roosevelt University in Chicago, and two associate's degrees, one in applied science and one in art from Oakland Community College and Macomb Community College. So she is one of our own alums that was able to develop herself professionally to become a very well, very well known consultant and researcher, both nationally and internationally. Um, as a management consultant, she's actually the owner of a company called PAC Production Leadership training and development and for over 30 years. And Dr. Castelli has created leadership programs that build skills and management capabilities in engaging, stimulating, and productive environment. Dr. Castelli has trained over 30,000 people in a variety of organizational settings. Her mission is to develop and deliver exceptional world-class training programs that promote leadership, and sorry, organizational growth based on integrity, trust, and mutual respect. Working with fortunately 50, 500 companies, corporate clients, and nonprofit organizations, she provides executive leadership training to, to develop the skills and competencies of leaders and managers in various industries such as manufacturing, automotive, technology, healthcare, government, higher education, nonprofit, and, prof and professional services. Let me give you the list of our uh, clients. So they include IBM, 
Whirlpool International, Amway International, the American Medical Association, Sara Lee Corporation, General Motors Corporation, many divisions and the headquarters, the United States Army, they come and are deck, 1-800-Flowers.com, Finnish Masters, the Paul Healthcare Health Center, Detroit Dance Testing Laboratories, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh, as the nonprofit and actually universities, she has been, uh, she has in, have clients as Oakland University. Every time we talk about us going to Oakland University and doing something for them, I, I don't like to miss the opportunity. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so. Oakland University, Seton Hall University, Bridgewater State College, Nova Southeastern University, and Atlanta, Atlanta Technical College. The interesting thing is, of course, is that experience and practice that are the impetus of uh, Dr. Castelli's research that focus on leadership and management, develop global leadership, managing multinational and multicultural organizations, reflective leadership, leadership motivation, management in global workforce and human resource management. Um, I'm not going to go over what she had done at Lawrence Tech because she had done multiple and multiple things at Lawrence Tech. I remember her being the, the director of assessment for the College of Management. I remember her being the first director of the DBA program. So I would keep on being here forever telling her about her service to the university. But I would like to just finalize by saying that she has more than 30 peer review papers, conference presentations, and proceedings. proceedings and she received numerous awards. So I would like to please help you, help me to welcome Dr. Castelli to give the presentation for Presidential Colloquium this year, and it's called Lessons on Leadership, My Research Journey. So thank you very much, Betty. <laughs> wow. I don't know what to say after that introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Boss, for your leadership to our university and for all the support and care you provide all of us faculty. Thank you, Dr. Mogul, for making uh, research such an important part of our work and for starting events such as these uh, that really highlights the accomplishments of our students in research. I'd like to thank my dean of the College of Management, Dean uh, Bauman Mirsharb who nominated for me for this award and the nominating committee. I'd like to thank you too. So welcome students, faculty, staff, and invited guests. It really is an honor for me to be here with you today. But in a way, it's kind of ironic. I grew up in a middle class neighborhood just northeast of Detroit and school wasn't really something that interested me. I remember in grade school, the teachers asked my parents if they could place me in remedial writing and reading classes because I had a hard time uh, with comprehension. At that time, there was no word, really. The word dyslexia wasn't really discussed a lot. Now we know all about it. So I grew up in an Italian family. My parents are from Italy. And their pronunciation in English wasn't the best. Mine still isn't today. I always tell my students that English is not my first language. Thanks for laughing. College of Management, remember our agreement? Laugh harder, <laughs> clap louder. OK. <laughs> so. Um, my family didn't have a lot of money, and college was a, something that wasn't planned for me. But I didn't care, because I had no intentions of going to college anyway. I remember uh, when my father died, when I was 16, I begged my mother to let me quit school. And I'm so glad today that she said no. So I was in high school. I didn't take it real seriously. One of the teachers asked us to do a research project on a famous historical woman. 
and everyone was giving really good presentations to the class. Rosa Parks, someone picked, someone picked Eleanor Roosevelt, Susan B. Anthony, Amelia Earhart, but everyone laughed when I gave my presentation on the Time Lady. <laughs> College of Management, I need you here. <laughs> Well, if you, and maybe you don't remember the time, lady, most of you don't, but in the old days, you remember? But in the old days, you had to call an actual number, this was before electricity, uh, the landline still worked, to get the correct time. There weren't computers in our homes, right? Uh, we'd also call the weatherman, W-E-A-T-H-E-R. When we were kids, these were fun things to do. So at any rate, uh, when my father uh, died at 16, uh, and when I finished high school, um, my mother uh, found out somehow that she could continue getting some of his social security benefits if I went to college. So she made me go to college. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. I wasn't prepared. It wasn't something that was supposed to happen. I had worked. Worked really hard since I was 15 as a hostess, then graduated to a waitress, and uh, I loved music. I sang on the weekends and played bass in an Italian wedding band, and I loved that. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Macomb Community College and take up music. So that's what I decided to do. And I was doing pretty good at music. You know, I was learning piano really well and music theory and feeling, you know, pretty confident. And at the end of the studies, I asked one of my instructors, Dr. K, if he thought it was a good idea if I went on to Oakland University to study music and get my bachelor's degree. And he told me, I think you'd be better suited for something else. And I don't know why he said this. I was doing good, um, making good grades, but this taught me an early lesson in life, and that is to watch the words uh, that you pick, that words can be powerful, very powerful. And because I had such a low self-esteem at the time, I believed him. I didn't question him, and so my dream of being a musician ended. So now I was in really big trouble. They probably wouldn't want me at Oakland University, but I still had to keep going to school. I couldn't quit. My mother was still receiving those benefits. <laughs> so I thought, well, yeah, I've been a hostess waitress since I was young. My mother uh, was the head of our high school cafeteria. She was the leader of our cafeteria in high school. And it was nice because she'd write us notes. We could get out of school and stuff. But. She'd worked her way up from a milk lady when she was four. She took me and my twin brother to work with her. Worked her way up from a dishwasher, a cook, to the leader of the cafeteria. And that really impressed me. And I admired that. And sometimes when there were large functions at the school, I'd help out with catering functions on the weekends and large events. So I thought, OK, I'll study food service management. So I enrolled at Oakland Community College's uh, food service management program in culinary arts. And I was really good at it and did well. And it was at Oakland Community College where I met my first mentor. And this is Mr. Bob Zemke. Uh, he was one of the teachers at OCC for a lot of my class. And he was really the first person uh, academically that really encouraged me and told me I was doing really good and I could have a career in management. And uh, so that's another important uh, leadership lesson that I've learned is it's so critical to have mentors, right? And to mentor others, you know, that we do both of those things. So shortly after I finished my degree, circumstances would have me move to Chicago and I loved it there. I moved in with my older brother, Randy, and we had a ball, didn't we? Those were good times. Um, right away, I applied uh, at a luxurious five-star hotel as a waitress, and I met with the food and beverage director at the hotel, and I said, if, can I work on the weekends and without pay to really learn the ins and outs of management? I just got an associate degree, and I want to learn about uh, the industry. 
And so he said yes, and for six months I worked really hard to learn all these new things, uh, like how to take inventories, how to create budgets, and how to really do uh, the work at a real organization. And when the first staff position opened, about six months later, I got the job. So here I was starting out in management, and I thought I probably need more formal education. So I decided, uh, at this point it was my idea, not my mother's, uh, to enroll and get my bachelor's degree at Roosevelt University in Chicago. And I did, and I did really well. And I really liked it, and I learned a lot about management. So I progressed in organizations from a supervisor, went to different organizations in Chicago as a manager, group manager, director, and I was uh, really doing well. But at that time, I would get very bored in positions. Uh, if I'm, once I like to figure things out when an organization's failing, maybe from operational or human resource or financial positions, but once everything's in the status quo mode, I noticed I kind of felt like a caged bird and I felt really bored. So I took a leap in faith and decided to open my own management consulting firm. And this is really another lesson that I'd like to share with you is don't be afraid to take risk. Uh, this was uh, many years ago and consulting is still something I enjoy. So sometimes in life we need to take a leap in faith and take risk. So as I was working uh, in Chicago, my mother got very sick and had uh, cancer, life-threatening illness. So in 1989, uh, my brother uh, and I decided we're going to move back to Michigan to be with our mother. We have a very close family. So at that time, when I was reestablishing my life, I thought, well, uh, I think it's a good time to go back to school and get an MBA. And I'm so glad that I chose LTU's College of Management. At LTU's College of Management, I learned the value of both theory and practice and was immediately able to apply all of my skills uh, out in the workforce. And at Lawrence Tech, I also learned a great deal about individualized instruction. And the courses were real scary for me. I don't know, most of you probably don't have an MBA, but there's all these finance courses, operations, strategic. And so I was really petrified, but I wasn't afraid uh, to take tutoring and take as much as I need, sit in the library, and learn whatever I needed to do to be successful. But the best thing about Lawrence Tech and the College of Management were the professors. Okay. I, I know some of you are trying to wonder, when was this picture taken? It was before the advent of Keller photography. <laughs> so here we have Dr. Raghavan on my left, and he's here today, and he was wonderful, very encouraging uh, with my classes, you know, always available in his office to help, you'll do fine, you'll do it. He was a great, great instructor, still is in our College of Management. And on your right, that's Dr. Lee Lar. He had a real booming voice, and was, he's just a wonderful professor, and I do really good in his classes. He'd go, Patty, but I know you can do even better the next time. But he was, he was very positive about it. Uh, Lou Petro, Dr. Petro, uh, was one of my professors, and he made accounting fun. You know, he had a great sense of humor, and he had a lot of industry experience, and he was wonderful. And Dr. Stan Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris, I had him in a professor in a lot of my classes, and he's nice enough to uh, come today. And I'd like to uh, everyone give an applause to Dr. Stan Harris. <laughs> Another uh, important mentor in my life. And toward the end of my studies, I thought because of uh, how the faculty were, uh, it made a huge impact on my life. So I made a bold decision, decided I wanted to be a professor. But I didn't know anything about it. And that's when Dr. Harris took so much time with me to explain PhD programs. I didn't know what was involved in the process. 
uh, told me to research different universities to find you know, a good program that would be best for me. And because I wanted to be a professor, uh, I did end up finding um, an excellent program at Wayne State University. And if it wasn't for Dr. Harris, I don't think I'd be here today. So thanks again, Dr. Harris. <laughs> So I uh, started my PhD at Wayne State University uh, and enjoyed all the coursework. And because uh, I was a consultant, I was able to be flexible in my work. I got a lot of big consulting jobs, and I was bidding against really big companies. Um, American Medical Association, Sarah Lee, Whirlpool, all the ones that Dr. Uh, Voss uh, mentioned. But so I knew a lot about management, and I saw firsthand how these top leaders motivated their followers. But how could I apply this to students, and me as a professor with students in classroom instruction? So I decided to do my dissertation research on motivation, because I wanted to be a good professor. I didn't know a lot about it. I knew a lot about training, but not formal you know, higher education. So my dissertation research, I looked at the motivating strategies used in instructional setting, Keller's ARCS model, attention, relevance, confidence, satisfaction. I also looked at the work of David McClellan with achievement motive. McClellan says there's two types of people or learners. Ones with a low or a high need for achievement. Low need achievers basically are very task intrinsic. They love uh, the process of performing a task and the challenge. They don't need any hand holding from the professor. They're very autonomous. But then there's the high need achievers, uh, the social extrinsic, who really need those pat on the backs. You know, those, you did a great job. They need a lot of feedback from the instructor. So how could I maximize um, the performance of both groups in a learning situation? I also looked at uh, the work of Malcolm Knowles, and he really is the grandfather of adult learning. Uh, before Knowles, there was really nothing specific about adult learning. You know, the need to make sure that the instruction is relevant, meaningful, task versus trying to make students memorize things. So his groundbreaking work and his principles were also included in my dissertation. So in 1994, uh, I completed my PhD, and my management consulting uh, was booming at that time. I did a lot of work uh, with a lot of divisions of GM. I started with one, I got another one, then another one, and before I knew it, you know, like Dr. Voss said, within five years I had trained 26,000 people just within their organizations, and I came in at a really good time. But I also started teaching part-time in 1995, about a year after I got um, my PhD. And I took an adjunct teaching position at both Lawrence Technological University, College of Management, and Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University, both teaching uh, leadership and management and their MBA coursework. So I continued my consulting. I still do a lot of consulting today because to me as a professor of management, it's really important for me to stay current in, in business and best practices and uh, emerging uh, globalization and all those things uh, that are changing rapidly in today's workforce. So uh, I took a, a full-time position. I was offered, and I was happy to accept a full-time position at Lawrence Tech's College of Management in 2000. And at that time, Lawrence Tech was pretty much a teaching uh, university. It was not a research university at all. So in the mid-2000s, it started changing kind of quickly. And it was really scary for me, because although I did dissertation research, I really wasn't a researcher. So I didn't know what it, it was like to publish in journals, uh, to conduct proceedings, to go and, and uh, have conferences with your peers in really big uh, auditoriums like this. 
And that's the next leadership lesson I learned, is really to never stop learning. Because I was surprised when I got here. I didn't know that I'd have to do all this research. But when you think about it, it makes sense. We're asking our students to research. But if we don't research ourselves, really, we're not very credible. So I did everything that I could. There were emerging technologies. By this time, the internet was worldwide. Online learning was just starting at Lawrence Tech. I was one of the first adapters with Blackboard. I worked with my colleagues on different instructional deliveries, hybrid, online, and traditional. And we wrote a lot of papers together. I also dusted off my dissertation. And I thought, if my model could work, um, with professors and students, because prof as professors, we are leaders in our classroom. Then I wanted to see if this study would also hold up with leaders in business and industry. So I conducted, I modified the survey, conduct conducted research, had about 360 responses. And the two most interesting findings from this research were that what followers desire most from their leaders is that they serve as coach and self-esteem builder. And this was regardless of high or low need achievement. So to increase interest, which is job satisfaction, out in the workforce, so if a leader wants to do that and also wants to increase the effort, maximize the job performance of his or her employees, uh, then they need to serve as a positive role model, a coach, and a self-esteem builder. About 10 years ago, I became very, interesting, uh, very interested in reflective learning. So what is reflective learning? The research from Cobb states that learners, uh, learners learn more about their experience when they spend time thinking about them. Pretty simple, right? We learn more when we spend time thinking about our experience. Now, in leadership applications, Hughes expanded this to the spiral of experience and his AOR model, his action model. You know, what did we do? We're always acting. We're always doing things. What was the observation? What happened? What were the results? What was the impact on others? And then the reflection. How would you look at it now? How do you feel about it now? And what would you do differently the next time? So this spiral of experience, the more we go through, through all three of these actions, the more we can learn and grow. But we have to go through the cycle. For instance, if we're just acting but not observing or reflecting on our actions, we're not really learning anything. That's why sometimes when someone says they have 20 years of experience, it may or may not mean anything if they're not continuously reflecting and observing their actions. So because uh, this taught me how to reflect, I thought the next type of research that I want to do, because it's a very powerful type of research, was I wanted to teach my students in classrooms how to reflect. So I developed this model. Uh, the instructor provides a safe environment, an atmosphere of trust promotes double loop learning. Single loop learners, really, they come into the classroom, they're apprehensive, they don't really, uh, they're not really open to new experiences. Where double loop learners are excited and they're open to constructive criticism, they want to learn and grow. So how does the professor promote double loop learning? Creating an atmosphere of trust and a safe environment. Interest and relevance in the subject. How does this learning impact me? It's very important that the students can relate to their personal and professional experiences. Critical thinking and reflection. Very deep care in the assignments, the projects, so that we're help students learning more about their values and uh, how their beliefs affect other people. And then challenging beliefs, realizing alternative approaches, views, and changing behaviors. And another name for reflective learning is also transformative learning. And it's very powerful. I use this in my classroom. And from the beginning of the semester, you know, by setting up a safe environment, by sharing our experiences openly, you know, by admitting you know, our mistakes and things we would have done better, by talking about our values, uh, you really can see a transformation from the beginning to the end of the semester. 
So this uh, model I decided next because uh, I teach leadership and I love leadership. I'm going to see if this model will work for leaders in business and industry. So I modified uh, the model, but basically it's the leader now instead of the instructor or professor. Interest and relevance in job task. It's very important for people to understand how my individual work impacts the organization. It's the leader's job to communicate that. Critical thinking and reflection, openly sharing lessons learned in meetings, realizing alternative outcomes. Okay, we had the strategic plan a year ago, but is it still effective now? Do we need to change it? Uh, have things changed? Um, and how do I change my behaviors as well? And then ongoing uh, dialogue and feedback. So we had a model, but now what we wanted to do was to test this model, to, to test the theory. So me and two of my colleagues in the College of Management, Tom Marks and David Eggleston, decided to create the first reflective leadership instrument. And we also uh, added cultural adaptation because at this time, globalization was in full swing and multinational, multicultural uh, organizations are everywhere. Even if we look at the base, the demographics of, of our students, in the last 10 years, it's trained, uh, changed dramatically. So we are living in a global world, a global village. So we decided that we would uh, create an instrument. It took a long time to do this. Our conceptual model, the reflective leadership aspects, uh, if the leader is conscious of the cultural adaptation, the customs norms is respectful to others, uh, then we hypothesize that that might increase sales, profits, and achievement of organizational goals. So after about, we started with about 120 in, uh, items on the instrument and ended up with these which were proved valid and reliable. So the next step was to implement this survey, and we were all real excited. So we were trying to find multinational organizations, large ones, that would let us implement our survey. And it was very difficult, difficult because of international laws, privacy laws, uh, and because we weren't actual employees in their organizations, even though we were researchers. And about this time, one of, our, one of my doctoral students in our DBA program had just completed his dissertation, Michael Schwartz. And he had used social media to conduct his research. So I thought, you know, I'm going to learn how to do this. It was the case of the uh, student teaching the teacher, right? And the teacher becoming the student. So here I was on LinkedIn. I spent the whole month of April this year. You have to find uh, different international leadership and management sites. The maximum is 50. That's what I had. I posted my survey. Um, I got permission from the moderator. I started discussions. I made friends with people. People were posting mine on their sites. And within a month, we had 714 completed surveys just within a month. Uh, representing over 81 nations. So this was an excellent sample of our population. And the results showed that leaders who create an open and safe work environment connect work with the organization's mission and challenge assumptions in the status quo do have significant impacts in goal achievement, profits, and sales. So, there were still gaps in the literature. So I decided my next research would uh, uh, look at four different research questions. So we proved that reflective leadership does improve um, organizational effectiveness, but there's no formal definition of RL in the literature, no guidance for leaders, no lack of construct. There's a lack of constructs, and there's not a universal framework for leaders wanting to practice reflective leadership. So uh, I first went on to define reflective leadership. The consistent practice of reflection involves conscious awareness of the behavior situations and consequences with the goal of improving organizational performance. How do we reflect, how do we practice reflection? It's made up of self-awareness and mindfulness, which enhances personal wisdom. 
Self-awareness is by focusing on our own behaviors instead of everyone else's or the external environment. And by focusing on our own behaviors, we're more accurately, accurately able to assess our strengths and our weaknesses and close the gap uh, with those weaknesses and make positive improvements. Mindfulness is the practice of staying in the present moment. Right now you're thinking, when's she gonna be through? I'm hungry, I want my lunch, I wanna look at these posters. I'll be done in just a couple minutes. But the University of Mass, I just read two days ago, has started a whole division in mindfulness uh, that is going directly into their medical program. So mindfulness, you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the future, it's very powerful. And then wisdom. Uh, when we can uh, think about the consequences and visualize actions before taking them, we can save ourselves a lot of grief if things don't work out. So wisdom is really looking at things before you do it and seeing is this really the best course of action. And through the research I found from the studies that it's a learned trait that can be developed up to 75% of the time. So for the last two items in the research questions, what are the constructs and how do leaders practice this, I conduct an examination and interestingly enough, leader and manage, management in the literature didn't have a lot about reflective leadership. There was more in organization develop, organizational behavior, education, sociology, psychology, and even neurology. I used electronic databases and when studies were substantiated, a min minimum of 15, it was then uh, viewed as a component of reflective leadership. And here's the six components. And then the next slide actually shows the framework that leaders can use for practicing reflective leadership. There, there's components, here's the behaviors and practices, here's the outcomes and the results. And if you want to learn more, come and see me during the poster session uh, after lunch. So, I was really proud that this paper that I published in 2016 did get an award. I mean, it, we need these validations sometimes, even though I'm a high need achiever, it made me really feel proud that the international leadership academic community felt my work was really valuable. And that's a good thing. So what are my next steps then? I'm still gonna be here a while. I'm like Dr. Voss and Dr. Ragman. We like our job, we love our jobs, why would we leave? So to ensure my teaching is current, I need to keep ahead of the fast pace of business because change is occurring daily. So I need to keep continuing my leadership uh, research to keep current and to teach it in my classes. I also want to continue research and methods to improve teaching effectiveness, particularly in online uh, teaching. And I have written a lot of papers on this. And I'll continue to because I think we've all realized online learning is not going away. If anything, it's going to grow. And conducting research with our students is vital to our university. That's why we're here today. My primary contributions have been in the way of dissertation research. Uh, with my students serving as their chair and committee member. And beyond that, um, helping our students who finish their doctorate degrees uh, get published, which is something I really wish would have happened to me when I finished my PhD degree. So helping students get published in peer review leadership and management journals um, is very rewarding. And our first, DB, our first DBA graduate, Kathy Schroeder, we did hers on quality management uh, perceptions. It was published. <laughs> and the last five years, I published with five students, and I plan to publish with all of them in the next three to five years. So how did this little person <laughs> who didn't like school, used to run in the backyard and hide behind the grapevines when the school bus came, and I did. <laughs> That's right, it was hard to get me up, I wouldn't wake up. Um, wanted to quit school when I was 16, had no intentions of going to college with very low confidence and no self-esteem, end up being a professor and a researcher. Well, I'm here to tell you that anything is possible. 
And whether we like it or not, life circumstances seem to push us along our intended uh, life's journey. And for me, of all the lessons that I learned, by far the most important that I'm learning is to believe in myself. So, in closing, uh, it's the relationships that we build with ourselves and others um, that makes our lives worthwhile. I want to thank my family and my friends uh, with, who have supported me without, throughout the years and without their support and unconditional love. Um, I wouldn't be here today or up here. And this also includes my College of Management family. So thank you very much and enjoy Research Day. Ha, 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 ha.